It's a phrase that you often hear, right? Create a sense of urgency, make it urgent, the client will buy. And so what I want to do today is really kind of, let's peel the onion, so to speak, get peel back the layers to try to understand what this really means, and then maybe provide you with some tools and maybe of a mindset. So when you're talking to a client, it's how do you create the sense of urgency? Now, before I get going, I just want to remind you guys, I launched Sales World, and if you haven't checked it out, salesworld.mv, as in metaverse, uh, Sales World is the first sales conference in the metaverse, absolutely free. Got over 20 great speakers in there. Go check it out, it's gonna blow your mind. Uh, check out like the Hall of Legends. So there's a conference center in virtual Singapore, but check out the, um, I got the Hall of Legends. You have to check out the Hall of Legends, see who I put in terms of who are the sales legends. Uh, so there's a Hall of Legends, almost like a Hall of Fame. There's also an entertainment lounge where you can get some entertainment. There's a comedy theater, there's a movie theater, and there's a couple of other cool things in there. There's the Island Retreat. So it's more than just a sales conference. You can go there, listen to different speakers. I got some great speakers in there. And you'll be assigned an avatar and you'll be able to cruise through the metaverse and actually network with other people. Mark D says, let's go, Matt. We're going to do this. So let's get back to this. Creating a sense of urgency. Let me erase this right here. And I just, want to, I just want to give you guys a perspective. And again, if you have any questions, hit me up with it. How do you create a sense of urgency? One of my favorite phrases, I wish I came up with it, but I didn't, is says, a customer will only make a change when the pain of the same, it's a key part here, when the pain of the same is much greater than the pain of change. Now, let's pause on this one for a second. This is a powerful statement that it isn't until the pain of the same, of doing nothing, is greater than the pain of change that the customer will change. In other words, if the current situation is bad but not that bad, they'll say, why change? So until the pain of the same, what they're experiencing today, is greater than the perceived pain of the change happens, then they, they'll change if you can create that sense of urgency. So this is what creating the sense of urgency is all about. This is where we lose a lot of deals because you haven't created enough pain. See, there's a statement that says, people will move twice, two times faster away from pain than they will towards gain. Let me say that again. People will move two times faster away from pain than they will towards gain. What does that tell you? Well, let's put this in practical terms. Too often, when we're trying to create a sense of urgency, we present clients with an ROI, return on investment. If you buy this, you'll get this future benefits, so forth and so on. ROI is all about being positive. Now, but there's another side to the coin that most people don't talk about, which is the cost of inaction, which is another analysis you can do. What I love about this, it's negative. What did I just say? People will move twice as fast away from pain than they will towards gain. Which means if you're always presenting ROI, that's the gain, that's the benefit, that's great. But this has 2x more power. What is the cost of inaction? What's it costing you, Mr. Client, not to make these changes? I'm not saying you don't use ROI, but this is like a one-two punch. This is the return on investment. But here's what's going to happen if you don't do anything. So let's again, let's peel that back to really understand what that means, right? So when you're doing a presentation, you get it. Present this, but let's talk about what this means to the customer. Now, let me go ahead, I'm gonna erase the whole board on this one. When we're talking about to a client, we have to understand where they're at mentally, right? They're typically in, in one of three states, right? Let me move this microphone over here. They're usually in one of three states. And that is, I'll do it in a ladder form. The first one is, you first have to make them aware that they had a problem. They don't even know. They didn't even know they had a problem. So the first one is to create that awareness. Very basic, not hard to do. But if the client's right here still, that means they haven't even thought about the problem. You just made them aware. Again, this is more education than actually selling. We then have to move them to the next step. So what's the next step? If they're aware, sometimes they know they're aware. I'll say this, they're aware, but they don't care. They don't care. 
They go, yeah, yeah. They go, I know. I know we need to do that. I know I need that product. I know I should be doing it. I know we need to change those process. I know our SOP is wrong. I know our standard work, SOW, you know, our standard operating work procedure is wrong. I know we have to make changes. We need that in our tech stack. I got it. I got it. I got it. But that's kind of what they say, really. Right? But in other words, they know, but they don't care. Here, they didn't know. Now they know. So if you get them from here, if you can jump up here, now they're here. And it's right here where we need to push them to the next step. And what's the next step? This is pure urgency, which is act now. And too often when we move people from aware to urgency, what we depend on a lot is ROI. And again, nothing wrong with using an ROI analysis, but everybody does it, right? What you need is to also present what is the cost of inaction, the COI, what's the COI, right? So in other words, if I can go from Roy to Coy, present the cost of an action and really document what that means, what does that mean to you, Mr. Customer? Then you're gonna have a more powerful presentation, which begs the question, how do you put together a good Coy, a COI? I'm glad you're here, check. So let me walk you through it. Cause it's easy to talk about the what, but let me show you the how, right? To me, it has two component, components. Cost of an action has two components, right? And that is, what is the present cost of an action plus what is the future cost of an action, right? And these two are usually tied together. And then I would add to this something called the opportunity cost, something most people don't document or think about. Let me give you a physical slash tangible example of what I mean. Again, keep in mind, we're talking about change of an action, cost of an action, how do we present it in such a way that it has impact? Here's how I do it. When I'm talking to a client, and it's usually about sales training, right? People call me, Victor, we need you to train our team. I give them the price, they go, ah, that's more than I expected to pay. Get that all the time, right? No matter what they tell me, I always know that that might be coming my way, but it's never really about the price. And all you have to do is shift their perspective if you know how to insert the cost of an action. Here's how I do it. I'm gonna show you how I do it. When I'm talking to a client, right, and they're saying, Victor, I get you, but your training's quite expensive for you to come in and do a workshop, to which I'm like, I don't think it's expensive. Can I ask you a question? And as soon as I say, can I ask you a question, what did I just do? Took control of the conversation. And there's certain data points that if I know them, I know I can present the cost of inaction. So for example, one of the questions I always ask is, Mr. Customer, what is your average deal size? Right? If you close a deal, what's the average deal size? Client says, Victor, it's $10,000. Insert your number. It could be $1,000 if it's transactional, $100,000 if it's B2B enterprise, right? But the average deal size, $10,000, right? And then I ask, what is your conversion rate? Right? And they'll say something like, eh, it's 30%, right? 30%. Translation, 30%. For every 10 deals, they're closing only three. Right? For every 10 deals, they're closing only three. That's it. Now, we can do simple mathematics here, but here's the third question I ask. Well, let me, let me show you this part first, then I'll give you the third question. That means they're leaving seven deals on the table, which means seven times that, and let's say this is per month, they're leaving $70,000 on the table. Seven deals that they didn't get times the 10,000. Now, in my head, I try to use a very simple approach. Mr. Customer, if we can get you from 30 to let's say four deals, would that impact your business? Well, that's one extra deal a month. That's 10,000, which is one extra deal a month, right? If they can just increase from 30 to 40, right? Just one deal a month. But then I ask the third question, which is how many salespeople do you have? Let's say they have 20 salespeople. Well, if everybody moves up their close rate by 10%, in other words, one extra deal out of 10, I would take that number, multiply it by 20, and now we're at $200,000 a month potential that they can actually grab in terms of business if they let me train their salespeople, right? So now I am saying to them, that means every month that you don't hire me or somebody like me, you're potentially losing out $200,000 a month. At the end of the year, multiply that tw by 12, that's 2.4, whatever it may be. You get the idea, it's a lot of money. So in other words, now I don't become that expensive. When they start looking at present and the future over the, near, the next 12 months, that's a big number. But wait, 
don't stop there. So now we've created some emergency, right? So this is like the cost of an action. But we got to kind of like, I'll just say, stick the knife in. Now we got to twist it a little bit so I can feel the pain of not, I know it's a, it's a brutal example, right? Brutal, brutal visual. But now you want to just uh, a little more, right? And then this is phase one. So in other words, this is two phases so far. First one is I get the data and I calculate it for one salesperson. Step number one. Step number two, I ask them how many salespeople and then calculate the full amount. That's step number two. Step number three, so I've done present, future over the next 12 months. Now I go for the third component of the cost of an action, which is opportunity cost. Think about this. If you, sell, if you don't sell somebody, how should I approach this one? If I sold a person and they gave me a referral, that's a potential deal I can probably get. So in other words, every time I close a deal, one, there's a referral element, right? Every time I close a deal, there's a referral element. In other words, another client, potential client that would buy something for $10,000. So that in itself has a dollar amount. You can figure that out. You can insert whatever number you think is appropriate. But I'll say, Mr. Customer, because you're not closing one deal per salesperson every month, you got 20. That's 20 deals we've left on the table, potentially. Maybe out of those 20 deals, we could have gotten one or two referrals. We're missing out on that. Mr. Customer, what number would you put in there? I like to let them insert the number because I want them to take ownership for the number. Now, I then ask the second part of the opportunity cost, which is the upsell. In other words, what is, you know, the customer lifetime value? Nobody ever thinks about this. Let me slow down. If I close a deal, I sell them at 10,000. On average, over the next two, three years, you'll probably sell them 30% of the actual original price. In other words, if I sold you something for $10,000, maybe over the next two, three years, let's say three years, I'll sell you additional 30%, which is another $3,000, right? So that's $3,000 in upsell opportunity I don't have because I didn't close a deal. So not only does not losing a deal hurt me because I don't get referrals, I also don't get the upsell, which then lowers my customer lifetime value. And again, I usually ask the customer, Mr. Customer, what's your customer lifetime value? Believe it or not, too many people go, I have no idea, Victor, never really calculated it, which is a shame. So what I typically do is say, look, if a customer bought today, and I usually use it three years as a window, over the next three years, how much more would they typically buy if it's a good customer? Then they give me a number, and then I can arrive at a customer lifetime value. But notice what I'm doing. I'm stacking pain. Yeah, stacking pain is what I said. I'm letting them know that they're losing deals, right? The 30 to 40%, right? Per salesperson. Multiply that by 20 salespeople over a year. That's a lot of money lost. On top of that, I'm losing the revenue opportunities. Ooh, that hurts, right? Not, last but not least, all the upsell and cross-sell opportunities are also gonna be gone. Mr. Customer, when you add all this up, how can you possibly say I'm too expensive? What's too expensive is not doing anything. It is the cost of inaction. Based on what I've just shown you, when should we get started? Or something like that, right, to close the deal. You get the idea. So again, ROI, is great. That's positive. Here's what you're going to get. and Here's how fast you're going to get your money back, right? But cost of inaction has more of a punch. If you can document, make it tangible, make it concrete, you can make those numbers real to them. And one of the tips I learned early on in my sales career, especially when you get to this part, is let them give you numbers. Don't insert numbers for them. Let them give you the close rate, for example. Let them give you the average deal size, which they will. But when you get to this part right here, let them give you, on average, how many referrals does each salesperson bring in? On average, after a deal is closed, what's your customer lifetime value? And you plug those numbers in. And if you have this as part of your presentation, you know, again, you do discovery, you get into the education, the demo, and as you're moving towards the close, you're blocking the objection by saying, look, Here's how much money you're losing by not having our product or service. And if you can weave this throughout a presentation, you'll feel it towards the end. You're not going to get big price resistance. But again, if you just focus on ROI, you're just looking at one side of the coin, the coin, 
the cost of inaction of not doing something, this is what it's costing you. And that's the pain that you got to deliver because pain always trumps gain when it comes to selling. And on that note, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, let me have you know if you have any questions. I'll go through it. And again, uh, let me see. Oh, I got some feedback here. Let me go through this stuff real quick. Uh, let me see. Mark's uh, OV is in the house. How to create a sense of urgency for speaker when conference dates are already set. It could also apply to account executives. When something's already set, especially you know when it comes to that, to getting a speaker, I think that's real difficult. So I had to think about that one, OV, because that's a tough one. Uh, Mark says, love, love the cost of an action. Coy over the Roy says, OV. Uh, Studio says, Chuckos, loving this, Victor. I use the uh, three Fs to convert. I will be adding this. Three Fs is feel, felt, found. Is that the one? Feel. I feel what you're saying. I too have felt that way too. Here's what I found. I think that's what you're trying to say. Uh, Chris is saying a lot of pain today. Yes, just a little bit of pain. Anyway, let me know what you think of that. Give me some feedback. I think it's a powerful strategy and we don't talk about it often enough. Again, that phrase, it isn't until the pain of the same is greater than the pain of change that people will make a change. And as soon as we learn how to generate urgency, and everybody talks about urgency, but they just kind of give it that very general feel, urgency. Well, well how do you do that? How do you document the urgency and make the customer believe it? Um, Derek says, quality, what's that screen you're using? This is a Vibe board, V-I-B-E. So you go to vibe.us, that's where you'll find it. I work, Mark D. Johnson, I work in a fast paced sales environment. How quickly can this be communicated? I don't think you can jab it down their throats. I think when you're creating a, a cost of inaction, try not to, you remember that um, <laughs> there's a story about, you know, 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag. I'm trying to clean it up here. Sometimes we try to dump too much information on clients. And when we dump too much information, they just shut down. So it's your job to curate what are the key points, the real quick hits that you have to give them that you know are going to spike them, right? That's what I would concentrate on. Ovi says, I needed this for my upcoming webinar I plan to put together. Good for you. Fit feature finance. Oh, that one. That's the I'll think about it, Mark D, right? When someone says I'll think about it. And then again, you give them the options. Is it fit feature or is it finance? My man, you've been paying attention to my stuff. I love that, man. One of the, again, we have to curate how much information we give a client. So when you're putting your presentation together and you're talking about the cost of inaction, you're trying to put that together, remember, you don't have to beat them over the head with it. What you do is you go through it slowly. So I used to sell a lot of telecom equipment, right? I came from the technology side, sold a lot of telecom equipment, and there was a lot of data we didn't have. So we had to be ready to go in there and ask the customer to give us data, information, users, for example, duration of users, uh, drop times, things of that nature. And then we would be able to plug things in. We actually had a spreadsheet where you can, a macro, where you can plug things in and we would calculate the numbers right in front of the customer and what it was costing them. It doesn't get more powerful than that because that's pure engagement right there. They're giving you the numbers. You don't have to argue with them because too often we bring the numbers and they don't believe them. Like it's like case studies, right? You bring in a case study to a client. Client says, of course, you're only going to show me the best clients your best case studies, right? So there's not a lot of credibility. They're nice to have, but case studies aren't powerful. But if you can make it about them, that's why we often talk about if your case study is aligned with that industry, that's closer to getting to impact, right? But then if you start sharing numbers, because again, we know that buying at the end of the day is very emotional, but we still got to get over the logical hump. Why would I want to do this? Convince me logically why I want to do it, and then mostly we'll get to that, why I should make that decision. So again, the cost of inaction is where you're really driving home what they're not seeing. And this is important, it's a very subtle phrase I just used, what they're not seeing. Because what happens is when you do cost of inaction, you're making the invisible visible. I don't know if you've thought about it that way, but when you talk about the cost of inaction, you're making the non-visible very visible. You're making the ethereal very concrete. You're tying it down because sometimes they haven't even thought about it. This is where we come in as salespeople, right? The thing is that the advantage we have as salespeople is we're standing outside looking in. We see things they don't see. Therefore, we go in and we say, here's what you're not seeing. 
and you tilt their head sideways, you bend it this way and make them see it. If you can do that, that's a more effective presentation. Anything else before I sign up? And again, pushing you guys, I really want you guys to visit Sales World. Uh, again, I just opened it. It's the first sales conference in the metaverse. Um, got a lot of traffic through there, so I'm really happy about this. So I'll go through it, let me know what you think. And on that note, I think I'm signing off. Take care, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Leave me some feedback, some comments, and we'll see you next time. See ya.